to cover legalism. We're going to finish up Galatians. But one of the themes we find that runs, intertwines with, especially with 1 Corinthians, is the fact of the tongue, the, deci- the tongue that is used in, in a proper way and, and maybe belittling and, and condemning doctrinally as well, a preaching false doctrine. And so I thought this evening we would look at what a subject matter as we stay in this series, a disciple's tongue. And this really kind of goes along a little bit of what we were talking about this morning. And I want you to look at what we find in James chapter number one. I want you to look at verse number 26, please. Now, James speaks a lot about the tongue. We find the tongue mentioned by Jesus Christ. We find the Apostle Paul writes about it. The book of Proverbs has, I think, nine or ten verses dealing strictly with our tongue and what we say. And James talks about it in James chapter one and also James chapter number three. It's been said when we look at the tongue, this is the issue of what we speak, what we say, how we uh, un- how we uh, uh, come across in our language and, and that type of thing, other than uh, the issue of money in the Bible, specifically money, one of the areas that is spoken about the most, one of the areas you will find the most in the Word of God, other than money, is the issue of your tongue. So it's something we need to talk about, our language, how we say, what we say, that type of thing. But look what the Bible says in James chapter 1. I want you to look down at verse number 26. It says there, If any man among you, if any man among you, and it goes on and says, Any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man religion is what? Vain. I want to speak, uh, preach a message I've titled this evening, A Disciple's tongue a disciple's tongue let's pray together dear heavenly father we thank you for the lord jesus christ we thank you for the word of god thank you for the convicting message this morning and lord i know that it convicted me as well as many others in the area of understanding the cost of being the disciple and tonight as we look at our language our tongue lord give us wisdom give us direction Rather than we point the finger at others, let us look right at ourselves. Let us humbly come before you in this area of the tongue in regards to confession and maybe what we need to do or to say. And we'll thank you for it. In Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. I want you to look, let's walk through some verses here and we'll kind of walk through this for a few moments before we get to the meat of the text. But I want you to look, if you would, at verse number 21. Excuse me, verse number 19. James is writing here, and he actually continues the subject matter in chapter 3. Wherefore, my beloved brethren. Now, he's speaking to who there? Christians. He's speaking, wherefore, my beloved brethren. Let every man, woman, child, individual, whoever that is, be swift to what? Hear. Mm. We could plant it right there and continue to go the rest of the night. I struggle with this verse. Be swift to hear and slow to speak. It says swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to what? Oh, have mercy on all of us. How many of us, and I put myself in this category, never hear at all. We start to comment maybe before the sentence is even finished. Have you ever done that? Raise your hand. And we're so quick. James is writing here and talking about your religious, your way of life, the way you present yourself. Be swift to hear. Be quickly. Be, let it sink in. It's been said, never make a major decision over an issue you've heard until you've at least waited 24 hours and prayed over it. How many of us have made so many mistakes in relationships and marriages and friendships and business-related issues, school, because we did not hear of a matter? 
We did not pray over it. And then he goes on to say, For the wrath of man worketh not. Your wrath is not the righteousness of God. You may think that. I may think that. But the Word of God clearly says, For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. You ever heard somebody say, I want to give you a piece of my mind? You say, I don't really know. You could give me something that small. No, I'm just teasing. Here's the point. It's not our job to give somebody a piece of our mind. We're to pray about it. Be swift to hear, so to speak. Then look at verse 21. Wherefore, <laughs> lay apart all filthiness. Put it aside. And I like the next part. Superfluity of naughtiness. Now, I don't know about you, but that really means wickedness, vileness, that it comes to the language's way. An overflowing, an overflowing of wickedness. Put that aside. The superfluity of naughtiness. And receive with meekness. So I was like, grafting a plant into another plant. Sir, receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. And then he goes on, be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. How many of that has we been guilty of? All right, look. I hear, but I do something different. Do be doers and not hearers only. What is the biggest complaint the outside world has against Christianity is they don't do what they say they believe. There's another word, hypocrisy. We put a mask on, we're this person, but in reality, when God, through the Holy Spirit, rips that mask off your face, this is who you are. You can call that superfluity of naughtiness, wickedness. And, and we look at this and conviction starts to bring and come into our blessed hearts. Now look what it says there in verse number 23. For any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass or a mirror. For he beholdeth himself and goeth his way and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed indeed. Amen. Well, look at the next verse. If any man among you seem to be religious, that word religious is a connotation of your belief system. Religion, belief, religion. What do you believe? If any man seem to be religious, and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart. This man religious, this man's belief system is in vain. So we look at this tonight. A disciple's tongue. Turn to chapter 3, please. Chapter 3. And that's just somewhat the introduction. Look at verse number 1. I'm going to go through a lot of verses, give some commentary, but the Word of God will help us on its own. Verse chapter 3, verse number 1. If you ever want a good study on the tongue, start in James chapter 1, flip over to uh, uh, James chapter 3, and then we'll go to the gospel records we'll find later in the book of Matthew. Look what it says. My brethren, again we're talking to Christians, be not many masters, knowing that we all shall receive the greater condemnation. Verse 2. For in many things we offend. That word we offend means we fail. We fail in many things. We offend all. If any man offend not. In other words, you don't offend with your word, with your language, with your attitude. If any man not offend, offend not in word, the same as a perfect man and is able to bridle the whole body. Here's what he's saying. You show me a man. Who controls his tongue, I'll show you a man that's able to control his whole body. Go on, verse number three. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole turn about their whole body. Ever, how many of you have ever ridden a horse? Raise your hand. 
The craziest thing I've ever done. I'll never get on a horse. You're not, God did not mean for us to ride horses. They're meant to be out west, you know, running around and doing whatever. I don't, every time I've got on a horse, I got a, the, they put the bits in their mouth and I said, that's, that seems so cruel, that thing that goes, that little piece of metal. And, but, you know, you turn it this way and the head turns and it goes this way. The problem is for me, when I've ridden a horse, maybe it's just me, I turn it and the thing turns around and tries to bite me. You know, I'm going, this guy's got a, you know, just goes all the way around. But we understand what James is writing here. He says, we put bits in their mouths that they may obey us. We turn about their whole body. And then he gives another illustration, which is even better. Behold also ships, which though they be so great, huge ships, and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned about with a very small hem, helm, rather, whithersoever the governor listeneth. In other words, have you ever been on a boat? You ever been on a boat and you can, in the back of the boat, there's what they call the helm, and you can, just a slight turn, you can turn an entire boat around by just a little piece of wood sticking in the dirt, sticking in the, in the dirt, in the water. It's like this. You can, an entire ship can move about with just a little member, just a little piece of lumber on the back of the boat that turns this way or that way. The entire ship turns now he's given the illustration about the tongue look at verse number five even so the tongue is a little member right not very big and it boasteth great things behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth you know the tongue can set the world on fire for the lord jesus christ a tongue can do great things for god but it can also be the work of the devil. Verse 6. And the tongue is a fire. The world of iniquity. So the tongue among our members. That it defileth the whole body. Is set on fire. The course of nature. And is set on fire. Of say it. Man this is serious stuff here. This is some of the strongest language outside of Matthew chapter 24 you will find in the Bible. This is very strong language. Set on the fire of hell, my tongue? By the way, everybody look here. Who is he talking to again? Christians. Christians. He's talking to Christians. Setting. Now look what he says here. Let me just read it again. He says, the course of nature and is set on the fire of hell. I stop and say, whoa, let's park it right here. Let's move on. For every kind of beast and the birds and serpents, I'm in verse 7, and of things in the sea is tamed and have been tamed of mankind. Now don't miss verse 8 because I'm going to come to that at the end this is how you get over it but the tongue can no what's the word after no you can't tame it on your own bud it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison see in the book of corinthians which we're going through and this is where i tie this together their biggest problem was their tongue Preaching bad doctrine, complaining about Apollos is doing this, Paul is doing this, they're not a part of us, he's not a part of that, splitting the place wide open. And then he goes on and says this I've got number nine, I got, well, to be fully, full disclosure, I got most of this underlined. But verse number nine is pretty interesting. Therewith, we bless God. Oh, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving my soul. Thank you for providing my needs. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And therewith, we curse men, which are made after the similitude of God. Whew. 
convicting, isn't it? Years ago, I read this when I was at Open Bible, and I felt I had to go apologize to somebody. And the way I handled it. I would love to tell you I've been here 19 years. And this verse has never applied to me, but it has. I would be lying to you. I believe I pray for control. I'm not talking about gossip or backbiting, but in attitudes and the way you say things. By the way, there's certain ways you can say things. Without having. Without. There's certain ways you can say things in a rebuking manner. That doesn't have to come across in a way that's sinful. I've had to apologize to my children. How many of you ever get aggravated with your kids? Raise your hand. Come on, raise your hand. No, you got the little angels and darlings. We know that because we hear that every day. You know, we, right. <laughs> and Scarlet is one of them. No doubt about that. Oh, boy, your day's coming, buddy. Lots of prayer. Oh, we love you, sweetheart. We love you. Now, look what it says. We move on. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be. Now, that makes sense. Nobody under the sound of my voice is ever going to disagree with this. Do the fountains send forth at the same place sweet and bitter water? No. Can a fig tree, my brother, bear olive berries, either, either of a vine, figs? So can no fountain both yield salt, water, and fresh? That's ridiculous. The same that loves God and praises God should not be cursing man made after the image of God. So, the tongue. Practicality. It destroy marriage. I've watched it. Words are said that are all for hard. You can forgive. You can love. But it's a lot easier to say that a boy than I got gotcha. you. And it will destroy marriage. Some people have been raised in homes where the entire first bullet up there is all the children remembered is yelling between mom and dad. We had a, in New Jersey, I may have shared this, I don't know, I'm, I'm sure I have. There was a couple that lived across the street from us. And Ann and I were, not baby Christians, but we were being discipled and coming along. We were really young. We were in our late 20s. Man, that was a long time ago. 1988. And this couple would scream and yell at each other in the front yard. They'd scream at their kids. And you would hear, that. well, that's just the way Philadelphia people are. They yell at each other. They don't give me that nonsense. Philadelphia people, are that's sin. And they would yell, and it would set us back on our heels. And we went to Open Bible Baptist Church. And we went there, and we visited. We said, we love this church, great church, good young couples. I mean, we got the word of God's being preached. I mean, Pastor Riddell, I mean, he just set this straight. Man, we thought we'd found. And then we said, oh, guess who goes here? They go here. And you know what we thought? Everybody look here. Don't miss this. We saw something wrong. Wait a minute. They go here, but they treat each other like that? The second thing, it can enjoy friendships, no doubt. It'll make a home, either a paradise or a desert. I'm not saying zippity doo dah and everything gets along. We all kick up our heels in fantasy land. Bad things happen. There is stress in a home. I know that. But we're speaking, uh, James is speaking to brethren. That shouldn't be that way. In a home, it can draw people to Christ or away from Him. We had a woman one time that worked at, I'll just say this, a local retail establishment and because of her tongue it turned her entire workforce against ever coming to our church 
It can cost you your job. I'll be very careful I say this because it's being recorded. I'll have a, I know somebody within the last 30 years. Is that going to keep it vague enough? <laughs> somebody that may or may not be a family member. And this person was on the phone speaking to his boss. He put the phone down and yelled at his children and said some very choice, choice words that were not good. The person on the other line, he didn't think they heard it, but they did. This person was an executive of a corporation. A graduate of a major college, if I said it, you know it, he has his master's degree, had a very high-end job. That person on the other line was so offended, they went to HR, Human Resources, filed a complaint against him for the language they heard, the way he talked to his children. By the way, this man claims to be a Christian, and because the way he said that, she filed a complaint. Look here, he was fired. There was no second chance because it was one of those politically incorrect words you don't get a second chance on. It can cost you your job. It can pull down a church. It can do so many destructive things. And I can go on and on and on. So the first thing, let's go back to James. We'll wrap this, we'll wrap this up. We're just getting started. But we'll look at things for a minute. Look what it says in verse 26. Verse number 26. Well, things aren't going well. My iPad, my iPad just went dead. I guess I'll just have to preach the Bible. Amen. <laughs> I do preach the Bible. Those of you who don't like technology, I understand that. No, I don't, but I'll, I tell you I understand it. But look what it says here in verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceive his own heart, this man's religion is vain. in vain. We see that. The importance of having a disciple's tongue. That word religious means a belief system. That's how that's translated. Religious. Your belief system. Your belief system of being a Christian, let's bring it down to earth, is in vain. Interrupting others. Gossip. Condemning others. Using slang or cursing. Using off-color jokes. There's certain language our kids were never allowed to have in our home. We call it bathroom talk. You, let, you may laugh at that. Let your four-year-old say it now and laugh. Watch what they're saying when they're 14. We never, we never put up with that. Because that comes out of the mouth. And Jesus had some, Jesus and the Word of God has some things to say about that. Was, it shouldn't be a part of our testimony. Turn to 1 Peter 3.10. Let's look at some. What Peter says, turn over just a few pages to first Peter chapter three. Now, I want you to look at verse 10. First Peter three, 10. First Peter chapter three, verse number 10. For he that will love his life and see good days. Do You want to see good days? Yes. Don't you also want to see good days? Peter's talking about this to a, a persecuted church. I'll give you the background. Let him refrain his tongue from what? Stop it. And his lips, they speak no guile. Turn to Colossians, please. Colossians chapter number 4. Colossians chapter 4. Turn back just a page or two or back in the... New Testament, Colossians chapter 4. Look what it says in verse number 6. Let your speech be always, always with grace. Mm. How are you known? How am I known? I've heard certain kind of preaching that some people excuse. They go, that guy's just a hard preacher. No, he's using words I don't allow my children to use. That's not hard preaching. That's ugly preaching. You can preach on sin and talk about sin without having to be ugly, condemning and making fun of people. I guard this pulpit. There's certain preachers that, and they're good men, but they'll never clock in this pulpit as long as I'm the pastor because that stuff, honestly, turns young people it turns me off 
not just young people. It says, let your speech be always with, always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how to answer every man. Proverbs 15, go there quickly. Proverbs 15, let me show you one more and we'll move on. And there's so much here. I did a little study on this in preparation. Not Proverbs chapter 15. See, in 1 Corinthians, they were just, well, he's doing this way, and I'm doing it this way, and he's, I'm a Paul, and I'm an Apollos. And I don't believe, you know, the whole thing started with just this disrupting spirit. And you go to Galatians, and, they're ta- and, and Paul had to settle it out. He comes in and says, wait a minute, you know, we're talking about legalism here, and you're going back to the law. You're going, you're going back, you're, you're, you're a hypocrite. You're saying one thing to me because I am not. One of the Judaizers, but when the Judaizers come in, you're a hypocrite. You say the same thing. That's where this all ties in. Look what it says in Proverbs chapter 15. Don't miss this, please. Look at verse number four. A wholesome tongue is a tree of what? It's life. Joyfulness. But perversiveness therein is a breach in the spirit. Matthew 12, 26 says this. Jesus says, but I say unto you, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account. We'll give an account for everything we've ever said or done. All of us. Don't think by saying, oh, just kidding. My kids, you say, well, we're just kidding. That's a cop out. You just tore somebody up. Just tore somebody up. I remember when my daughter was in high school, right before we moved here, there was a man, young man. He was 11th to 12th grade, but he was kind of slow. And he was at our Christian high school. And there was a group of, quote, cool teens. Do you know who the cool teens are? Anyway, the cool teens thought it really fun to make fun of this little bit obese, slow guy. Remember his name was Joe. And I got in sin because I got so mad at one of them, I kind of, I didn't push him against the wall, but I said, if you're going to pick on somebody, pick on me, please. Now, I, it was wrong. I probably could have gotten fired today. Who knows? I probably go to jail. I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't hit him. I didn't push him. I didn't, don't, please, don't come from this that I was physically violent. But I thought of that when they were making fun of this guy. If you have to error with people, always give them the benefit of the doubt. Try to be gracious. There's nothing of God and tearing down anybody. And you'll never find it in the Bible. It may get you a laugh. It may get you a joke. I try when I preach, when I get nervous. I told you this the other day. I use sarcasm, and it's usually me. I'm a bumbling idiot. I point at me because I don't ever want, and occasionally if it does go to somebody else, I apologize. If I'm going to make fun of anybody, it'll be fun of me. I mean, I know how bad I am. I mean, when... You know, God made me. He broke the mold. It was really bad. That's why I'm a sinner saved by grace. Amen. And I'm nothing short. By God's grace, I I just I thank the Lord every day for saving me. But the importance of having a disciple's tongue, Jesus says we will give an account for every idle word we speak. Now, let's park it right there and I'm going to move on. That's really convicting. Running down others, making fun of others. You're not going to get out of it. Number two, quickly. The implications of not having a disciple's tongue. I'm going to walk through these fairly quick for the sake of time. What are the implications? And I want you to go to Colossians chapter 3, if you would. Colossians chapter 3, and just stay there. Can you go to Colossians 3 real quickly? I 
I was in a, I've told this story. I know I've told it before, but it does apply to this. I was in a, let's go to Colossians 3. Let's read this and I'll get to it as we move on. And I will move quickly. I, I promise you that. Look at verse number 8. It says Colossians 3, 8. It says something interesting. But now, he goes on all the things about mortifying your body, dead in your body, fornication, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, idolatry, blah, 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 etc., etc. And then he says in verse number 8, but now put off these things as well. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. He's got all of these things done with the body that we absolutely adore. And then he says, oh, by the way, that's not all of it. The stuff that comes in your mouth's got to stop too. The implication is not having a disciple's tongue. Just as you take off dirty clothes at the end of the day, we should discard the old ways of using the tongue. By the way, most disciples don't have a problem with drunkenness, stealing, adultery. I'm not saying they're not issues you struggle with, but we all have struggled. Everybody here has problems with some of these. All of us. And he lists them here. See them? Anger. This means a deep smoldering, slow burden, refuses to be pacified. It says that person, that issue, that situation, that boss, that child, it's an attitude. There are people sitting in the prison tonight because of anger. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 12, look at verse, well, let me just read it for the sake of time. Oh, generation of vipers, how can ye be in evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. A good man out of the treasures of his heart bringeth forth good things. An evil man out of the treasure bringeth forth evil things. So he says, put that away. Number two, wrath. Wrath. Wrath is a sudden outburst of anger. We've all been there, right? It's anger in action. It's a tongue let loose. Most disciples would never think of hitting somebody, but they'll sure have an outburst of anger. Interesting. The third one there is malice. This is where it really gets ugly. An attitude of ill will toward the person. In other words, you really hope something bad happens to them. Ill will. You submit that to the Lord. Get on your hands and knees and pray God's forgiveness. Don't let the devil get a foothold in that. Some of you got family members that have hurt you so bad. Some of you have been in abusive situations and I pray that that would never be a part. You've just got to ask God for grace. So many of you have been hurt by others and you're saying, I pray that does. I have a check in my spirit with my wife. I don't want any malice. Malice. An attitude of ill will. Evil intent. It's what causes someone to be sad when their enemy succeeds. You ever seen that? They get a raise and says, who'd they lie to get that from? They get a new car and say, well, they must have done, you know, they, and you may not say it out loud, but you think it. As Rich Tozier said, and he was at our wilds, he preached to our teens, stop your stinking thinking. And he's not the originator of that, but he does have a message where he says that. How about blasphemy? Relate this to people, it means slander or tearing somebody down. A Christian would do that, remember, when we reference this and cross-reference this with Colossians and James, of course Christians can do that. James 3.8 says, But the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil of deadly poison. And we read that. How about this one? Filthy communication. This is obscene language. It's dirty talk. Some of you are around it all the time. I, I was around at work all the time. That was like I worked in Philadelphia 
primarily South Philadelphia is where our office was. And people from South Philadelphia, even some that claim to know Christ, said that's just the way our culture is. We really don't mean it like it sounds. I said, are you kidding me? By the way, when you talk in your home, your children will go, what you do in moderation, they're going to do in excess. A disciple should never be heard talking that way. I was in line, made a mistake. How many of you ever made a mistake when you went to the store and said, why am I here? Yeah, that's why I like Walmart has that app where you can order groceries. If we never went to a store the rest of my life, I'd be great. Why would you want to go shopping? Ugh. Ugh. Better things to do. I'd rather watch grass grow. At least that didn't cost you anything. But I was in a shopping on Black Friday. And I was dumb. <laughs> oh, let's do something really neat. Let's get up at 4 in the morning, get dressed, have a cup of coffee, drive in line to fight people we don't even know to get something I can get online cheaper the next day and get it delivered for free. But we bought it really cheap. It's just buy because we fought for that. I got a great deal on that. Anyway, I was in line. And I'm standing there. And these women behind me are going, da, 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 da. just, it was awful. I won't even give any suggestion of what they said. But it made me kind of blush. And I guess I've been in the Christian bubble so long, I didn't know people talk like that, especially young women. That's filthy communication. Lying. Deliberate untruth or half truth. If it's a half truth, it's a whole lie. Right? You know, you can manipulate things, and I, we all have to be careful of this because we all think our fish don't stink. That's a New York saying, by the way. If you lived in the south, around the lower end of Manhattan, our fish don't stink because that's where the fish market is. And we all have a way of making it sound. It may be X, and technically, we're correct. How many of you are with me? Say amen. But the way you kind of say it, you sanitize it a little bit, you throw a little salt on it, so the sting isn't quite so bad. No, it's still not true. It's still a lie. Your fish does stink. Throw it out. That's what lying is. What does the Word of God say? The Lord detests lying lips. If you always tell the truth, you never have to remember what you said. So, in closing, and you're saying, praise God, this is killing me. What's well, killing me too? Do you think this doesn't involve me? Some of them, you know, we deal with it. Before you start pointing fingers and say, oh, somebody, they need to do that. They point your finger at yourself, bud. This is what was going on in the church of Corinth. This kind of stuff. Look what it says in James chapter 3. Verse number 7 and 8, and we'll close. Well, I can put it on the screen for the sake of time. For every kind of beast, every bird, and serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed. And heaven tamed. God says they're all under mankind. The first... Sign of victory, everybody look here, and I'm almost done, is you can't control it. Stop. You won't. It's impossible. You've got to have the Spirit of God to control your tongue. Some of you are raised in homes where that kind of stuff just went on, and you think it's normal. No, it's not. It's unchristian. It begins with a thought process. Philippians 4 8 says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are good report, if they are lovely, whatsoever they are lovely, excuse me, what things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Stop your stinking thinking. Colossians 4 6 says this, and I don't have it on the screen, but it says, Let your speech be always seasoned, be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every man. We just went over that. Here's the answer right here. Stop it. How do you stop it? You submit yourself to God. 
Say, God, first of all, you get right with God and what you have done. But second, you say, God, I, gotta, I can't control this piece of flesh in my mouth. And I want to praise you. And I don't want to, excuse me, I don't want to praise you and curse mankind. I want to praise you and lift up mankind. There's a huge difference. Let me tell you what will happen. And I'm done. You can close your Bible. We'll pray. Over the years, some of you long timers know this, we've had some difficulties. Not my wife and I, I mean, marriage wise. We have the best marriage ever. We've never, got, well, I just said about lying. We've never got an argument. <laughs> well, we've gotten in the last day. No, I'm just teasing. Remember, sarcasm has its place. <laughs> But we've gone through some difficulties. And my knee-jerk reaction was to get up in the pulpit and defend myself and say something. Walt knows what I'm talking about, Al and some others, some of the long time rich. And I just said I can't do that because your enemies won't believe it and your friends don't need to hear it. So I'll let my testimony and who I am be what it is. And can I say this? Here's where, we, here's where we get in trouble. When we think we have to defend ourselves when there's nothing to defend. Because sometimes we over-defend ourselves and by the sense of over-defending ourselves we get in the very sin that was done against us. How many of you know God sees it all? How many of you believe that? Say amen. That's easy for me to say. It's easy for you to amen it. But it's true. And when we deal with this kind of stuff at your work, some of you told me some of your work situations. I'm going, oh, man, I'm so glad that I'm not there because you got people just doing some really nasty things to you at work. Don't go around belittling them. Pray for them. Don't get caught up in that. I had a girl I worked with, young lady. You've heard the story. She won the lottery. Another one won the lottery. And they all cussed at each other, fought each other because they won this big lottery. And because of their rotten testimony to the, my boss, he fired the entire floor. Got rid of everybody. Nobody was left. He said, I'm going to fire everybody that's involved in this lottery. And the, my boss was not a Christian, but he just said, this gossip and this backbiting of who won the lottery and who did it, that's going to stop. It's tearing our company apart. He fired the entire floor of the drafting department. Back then we had drafters or cab guys. Now everybody does it themselves. Here's the point I'm trying to say. Sometimes you just got to give it to the Lord. Some of you are hurting because you've been maligned by family and friends. Family's the hardest part, isn't it? Really hard when it's a family member. That's probably the worst. What did David say when it's a friend? My old faithful friend. Can I say to you tonight as we close and I'm done, let's all stand together. Let's just pray and ask God for grace. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time.